Welcome back to the Fire Emblem Awakening Definitive Guide. Today, we'll be talking about classes and skills. I will not be talking about any of the characters specifically, as this is meant to highlight the general classes and what they have to offer, as many units have overlapping classes and skills that they can acquire. I will also discuss those very skills and if they are worth grinding for. In the next video, I will be talking about the playable characters and what fits for them individually, as doing that video later on will make it easier on us all than Say's repeated explanations. Now how I will be doing this is going to need elaboration. I will start with explaining the basic classes only first, their skills, where said skills land on the tier list, and then move on to the next. Yes, there's going to be a tier list for the skills, but also one for the advanced and special classes. Speaking of, once all the basic classes are finished, we will move on to all the advanced classes, and finally, the unique ones meant only for specific characters, as well as the DLC. Alright, with everything explained, let's begin. First on the docket is the Cavalier class, the horse rider and is easily one of the most mobile units in the game right from the start. Most will have a balanced stat line, with their one weakness being magic. They make up for this by having swords and lances, with that leading to access to javelins. While there is no Kanto in this game, that is easy to forgive once you have an understanding of the meta. Their first skill is Discipline, easily one of the best skills for the early game and for grinding weapon ranks. You gain twice the amount of points when you use a weapon and you can carry this skill into new different classes and work your way up the ladder quickly. It goes into the situational rank, but that's more so because this is for grinding purposes only. The other skill is Outdoor Fighter, which grants hit, 10 avoid in outdoor maps. Situational and all that worth it. Next is the Cleric class. This is a pure healer who cannot fight back and are units you want to get to level 10 as soon as you can. Staves are obviously not a bad thing to have as well. You do need to keep your allies healthy in between skirmishes, and over the course of the game, better staves like Physic will be much more helpful. Rescue staves are actually a really good for the early game as you can use them regardless of rank and they give plenty of EXP. The first skill is Miracle, and it's based on your luck stat. In the early game, is a shot in the dark, but later, once you cap your stats, you can make it to about a 50-50 shot or higher. There is a whole niche gimmick with this skill, but I need to get to the advanced classes before I can explain that. For now, it goes into the situational tier. The other skill, Heal Touch, will go into the early game tier as it only provides plus 5 to your total HP healed when using any heal staff. This is great in the early game, but once your units start having higher magic and better staves like Mend, this will be less effective. The Archer is a ranged only attacker that cannot fight back if they are attacked adjacently. The accuracy of bows is great, but the damage isn't all that great as most Archers don't have that much strength to begin with, especially in the early game. Skills plus 2 needs no explanation, and it along with other similar skills go in the early game tier. Presence grants hit and avoid by 15 but only during the player phase. This can help, but honestly, it's not worth keeping long term. It goes in the situational tier. Mages are magic hitting units who can attack from 1 to 2 range, but are usually rather squishy, so they much prefer hitting targets who can't fight back. Magic plus 2 is a thing, and focus on paper sounds fun, but when you realize how you should use your units efficiently, it just doesn't work. If there are no allies within 3 spaces, the unit gets plus 10 crit. There are better ways to get your crit up, so that's just not worth it at all. Fighter is a male exclusive class that is an axe user with high power and high HP, but generally has middling speed and low skill, making it hard to hit some enemies. HP plus 5, unlike the other skills, has a more consistent use in the early game, as those 5 HP points can make the difference between surviving a round or having to reset the game. It is not something you'll keep forever, but it's a skill worth having if you plan to use units that have this skill from the start. Zeal grants a consistent plus 5 crit rate, which for more accurate classes would be nice for, but for fighters, it's not that helpful. And by the time you can get better classes and stats, you'll have other skills that are far more deserving of your coveted skill slots. Knights are physical tanks. High defense is their game, but they have low speed, so they tend to get doubled. Having access to javelins can make them fight ranged units, but mages and units with armor effective weapons are the last thing they want to fight. These are not units you can depend on to wall everything, but if you place them at good choke points, you can funnel enemies and make your knight have a better time since enemies all can't gang up on them and attack them at once. 
Their skills are Defense plus 2 and Outdoor Fighter. Both skills are not worth your time and effort. Pegasus Knights are a female exclusive class that are some of the most mobile units in the game, being able to traverse through almost any terrain with no restrictions, being very fast, high res, and having high skill, but having low strength and frail defense. They are weak to bows and wind magic, but their role should be either ferrying some units across the map with the pair up function, or picking off mages as their high res makes them more durable against magic and they can dodge their attacks with some consistency. Their skills are Speed plus 2 and Relief. Relief is a weaker, more situational version of Renewal, where you need to be 3 spaces away from allies to restore 20% of your HP, which is not worth it at all. The Myrmidon is also a fast, highly accurate attacker like the Pegasus Knight, but is an infantry that uses swords. They're great at finishing off units, but also with their doubling potential are good at chipping someone down to have another slower unit come in to clean up. And while they can dodge, be ready for them to take a hit or two, especially against other sword users or lance users. Avoid plus 10 helps for dodging better, which in conjunction with this class makes the evasive Myrmidon even more dodgy. But the real prize is Vantage. This skill is arguably the second best early game skill you can get from a basic class, as it lets you attack an enemy first if you are at or below 50% HP. This is a last stand type of effect, but obviously you're in a bad spot to begin with, so this isn't a situation you're looking for. Unless this is paired up with other skills. Again, I can't mention them just yet. But just know this skill is the first in the great to have category. Mercenary is a more balanced style of play compared to its counterpart the Myrmidon. While it has a respectively above average speed stat, they have better bulk in exchange. The skill Patience makes them more evasive in the enemy phase, and this is good to have for the early to mid game. The main skill worth anyone's time, however, is Arms Thrift. It's a passive skill that, if triggered, doesn't allow your weapon to degrade. This is based on your luck stat times 2. While in the early game, this is a rare trigger, as you go on, it will become more frequent as your luck stat rises. If your luck reaches 50, that means it will always trigger and thus your weapons will never break. When you consider you can forge your own broken weapons, this means those will never break and you can carry them with you forever. This is absolutely a meta tier skill. The Trobador is the same class as the Cleric, but a female exclusive class that is on horseback. As such, this makes them a much more mobile healer, but they cannot fight back against any enemies. They have Res plus 2 and Demoiselle. The latter is a passive skill that if there are any melee units within 2 spaces, they take 2 less damage. While in the early game that might be a good deal, it's otherwise a skill that isn't worth your time. The Thief is a fast, albeit very frail unit and is not suited for multiple rounds of combat. Their damage is more so chip damage, and they're best at hitting enemies that can't fight back or to simply finish them off. Their skills, however, reflect their other role and that is to open things in the map. Lock Touch lets you open up chests and doors without a key, and considering you can take this skill into other classes, this unit can be very, very helpful for the story only and some DLC maps. Movement plus one is what it says it is. A thief with this skill can move six tiles, which is what your average promoted infantry can move, and that would be seven with this skill upon promotion. And you can see how this can go well with other higher mobility classes like, say, a Flyer or a Cavalier unit. It's situational, but that plus one can come in clutch sometimes. The Dark Mage is the opposite of the Mage, slower and less accurate, but it hits hard and has some physical bulk. They also prefer targeting units who cannot fight back from range. Its skills also reflect on making up for its weaknesses. Hex lowers the avoid of all adjacent enemies by 15, and Anathema reduces avoid and dodge by 10 for all enemies within 3 spaces. While these skills are situational, Anathema can help the whole team and not just the one with the skill, so that's something worth noting. The Wyvern Rider is the opposite of the Pegasus Knight. More physically bulky and a harder hitter, but more frail in the res department. Regardless, it's a very reliable class, and while you get it in the mid game, its promotions are what you're really after, as the skills Strength plus 2 and Tantivy are not worth your time. Tantivy has the effect of plus 10 hit and avoid if you're alone, 
And while that is nice, an A or S support can give you that and then some. The last basic class is the Barbarian, and you can't actually recruit anyone who starts as this class, but you can second seal into it. It's very similar to the Fighter, so I won't repeat myself here, but the skills are different. Despoil will give you a small bullion depending on your luck stat, and while you can use this to get some money, it's not worth depending on, especially if you have the Golden Gaff DLC. Gamble will drop your hit rate by 5, but will give you plus 10 crit. While this isn't good on a Barbarian, you can take it to other classes, but by that point, it isn't worth your while. And with that, we have all the normal classes out of the way, and we're a third of the way through the video. And I'd like to take this moment to ask of you that if you are enjoying this video, I implore you to consider subscribing as it helps support the channel and myself. I do not just make Fire Emblem videos, but I also plan to release more reviews and discussions alongside other different subjects. So, I hope you are interested in more of my work. Thanks again, and now on to the rest of the video. The advanced classes are where the majority of your good skills are coming from, so this will be more detailed than the basic classes, as those were merely stepping stones for the early game. First is the Paladin, the first option for cav units. This has a more balanced stat spread and keeps the same weapons, but gains one more movement for 8 total. Despite their balance, they are very reliable for both attacking and defending, with their skills reflecting this. Defender grants plus one to all stats when paired with another unit. While this isn't a skill you'd keep, it's okay to have in the mid-game as this extra point might give you the edge when it matters most. Aegis is the real prize for units that prefer multiple rounds of combat. With your skill as its activation rate, it will have all damage from bows, tomes, and dragon stones. This can trigger multiple times, but it should be paired with a skill that restores HP so you can get more mileage while also not risking death, as this will not stop an attack from killing you. Defender is situational, but Aegis is great to have. The opposite is the Great Knight, but this puts more focus on physical bulk than a balanced stat line. While you keep 7 movement, you gain access to your repertoire and thus have complete mastery over the weapon's triangle while you still need to avoid magic and gain armor weaknesses. Having all these options mitigates it somewhat. Your skills, however, are some of the better skills in the entire game. Luna ignores half an opponent's defense and is based on your skill, so it can frequently shred through your enemies. And, the more bulky they are, the more it's gonna hurt. Dual Guard Plus is one of the better support skills in the game, as it gives a flat 10% boost to the odds of a Dual Guard triggering. As mentioned in the first video, dual guards outright block all incoming damage from an attack, and the higher your support rank, the more likely it is to trigger. With most S support partners and just this one skill, you can boost the odds of it triggering into about 1 in every 3 attacks. The best part of this skill is that it doesn't matter if the holder is in the front or the back, just being in the fight has it in effect. So if you have a unit that prefers being in the back line, this is a must have for them. Both of these skills are no doubters in the Great to Have tier. The General is the promoted version of the Knight and has an absurd amount of defense. Naturally, they're weak to magic and their main role in my mind is following another unit to pair up to share their bulk with them. But if they have to take the front, they can hold their own against melee attackers with their second skill, Pavis. It's the opposite of Aegis, as it has all damage from melee attacks and beast stones if triggered. The other skill is our first Rally skill, Rally Defense. I won't elaborate on them all just yet, but all of them have their own category, so they'll get their time together when I reach an important one. Next is the War Cleric slash War Monk. They get axes to finally fight back, but they still are support units above all else. They have Rally skill, and their second skill is Renewal. At the start of every turn, the unit will gain 30% of their max HP restored. So, on an ally with 80 HP, they'll restore about 23 each turn. On bulkier units, this can be great, but it shouldn't be depended upon. Make sure to have the ideal stats, so you can actually take the hits well, as putting this on a squishy unit is just a waste of a slot. This goes in the Great to Have tier. The parallel to this is the female exclusive class, Valkyrie. 
they fight with tomes, and this is honestly better for them, since they're already leaning into their magic stat line for healing. Their skills are Rally Resistance and another top tier support skill, Dual Support Plus. This skill boosts your support bonuses even further by up to 4 levels, so you can imagine how helpful this is with S support partners. Also, there are some male child units who can't get the broken Gale Force skill, so this is a fine alternative if they can get it. The Sage is the next magic class, and this is a very hard hitting magic attacker. They can share the power with Rally Magic, or use their Tome Fair skill to make their magic attacks hit even harder. Tome Fair adds plus 5 to your attacks if you're using any tome to attack, and this is for all tomes, so Dark Magic also gets a boost from this, and considering you can take this to the Sorcerer class, you can see why this skill goes into the Great to Have tier, bordering on meta. We'll talk about a male exclusive class next, and the first one is the Berserker. This class keeps the axe only, but gains the skill Axe Fair to add even more power to their attacks, and their other skill is Wrath which activates if you are at or below 50% HP, giving you plus 20 to your crit rate. Now, being in such a dangerous state, mix this with Vantage, and you might go out in a blaze of glory. There's a combo of skills with this one that is really absurd when it comes to fighting other people's teams, but I'll get to that real soon. Next is the Dark Knight, and it tries to be a mixed attacker, sporting swords and tomes, but sadly, despite Dark being in the title, it doesn't actually use Dark Magic but at least you have 7 movement. The first skill is Slow Burn, and from turn 1, you'll gain 1 hit and avoid every turn until turn 15, where you cap out at 15 hit and avoid, and then it all goes away. This has some useful purposes, such as battles that will go on for long, but not too long, such as Apotheosis. Once turn 15 passes, this skill is useless. I'll put it in the Situational tier. The second skill is Life Taker, and this has very interesting applications. If you attack during the player phase and defeat an enemy, you can restore your HP by 50%. That's really good, and in some ways, it's better than Renewal. But remember, you must kill an enemy to get this effect, and in situations where you're fighting bulky, fully healthy enemies, there's a chance you might not get that KO and thus have your HP not healed. Renewal is always guaranteed to do 30%, but Life Taker has that opportunity cost and is a riskier option. Ultimately, it's your preference, so this will go in the Situational tier. The Sorcerer is the promotion of the Dark Mage, and dear god, these skills are absurd. Of course, the unit doubles down on its strengths, but Tome Breaker makes this unit ideal for fighting other mages, as this will make them 50% more accurate and the enemy 50% less. It should be noted that if, say, both units had this skill, they would cancel each other out, but still, it's a great skill to have. But the other one is absolutely one of the most broken skills in this game if used properly. Vengeance is an attacking skill that grows stronger the less HP you have, and triggers based on your skill stat times 2. Like Arms Thrift, if you're at 50 skill, this will always trigger. Let's give an example. Let's say you have a max HP total of 80 and you only have 10 HP left. That means if this activates, it will divide the difference by 2, so 70 divided by 2 is 35, and you are going to hit the enemy for 30 HP. Now, it's going to hit for 65. This sounds great, but you're in a bad spot, so isn't it kind of risky, I hear you say. But ah, young viewer, you see, this is only the beginning. Let's make this more fun and broken, shall we? So imagine the situation again, but instead, you're already dying and an enemy is attacking you, but you have Vantage, meaning that unless they attack with a longbow, you're going to have an attempt to hit them. But I'm, I'm not, not done, done yet. yet! Let's add Wrath to the mix. That's plus 20 to your crit rate, but I'm still not done! Let's give you a customized Nosferatu Tome, which, in case you forgot, heals you for half the damage it dealt. Now. Remember that it hit for 65 HP, meaning you're getting about 32 HP back. But you might not even want that. You want to stay at low HP, so you can keep hitting hard with this setup. How busted this can be with the right support? And we didn't even add boosted stats, a crit rate from a high crit weapon, or supports. So this really can become a disgusting enemy to face, but for you, this 
is an absolutely disgusting unit you can build, but I'll let you figure out the rest and practice this on your own as this kit is an absolute menace to society and worth putting on your street pass teams to give other players hell. Vengeance is mine and it is in the meta tier. Moving on to the other male exclusive class, we have the Warrior. Unlike the Berserker, they gain a second weapon in the bow, and while that might seem bizarre, it makes some sense when you consider their second skill, Counter, one of my personal favorite skills in the game. If you were hit by a melee attack and it doesn't kill you, the attacker takes that same damage. A silly trick you can pull off is getting hit by a crit that would kill you, activate Miracle, and then it will hit them. There is nothing you can do about this as the attacker. It will just kill you, says no skills can activate in this circumstance. It's not something I'd ever do, but it can happen. This skill can pair up really well with heal skills like Renewal or Soul as to restore what was lost, but of course, make sure you have the bulk to use it. Sometimes enemies will not care if you have this skill. I put it in the good to have tier, but there's one problem that I'll get into later when we talk about another broken on paper skill. Oh, and the first skill is Rally Strength. The alternative class to this one is one of the best infantry classes in the game, the Hero. They use axes and swords, but also have a great stat line and great skills to boot. The first skill you get is Soul, and this is the opposite of Luna, and a more aggressive option compared to Renewal. When this triggers, it restores your HP based on half the damage you dealt, so if you hit for 20 HP, you'll restore your health by 10 HP. What makes this different from Renewal is that it has to activate based on your own skill stat, and considering heroes have high skill stats, it's pretty easy to activate, but of course, one bad string of RNG can ruin that for any player. So again, it's a preference, but if you have no way of getting Renewal on the unit, you can make do with this. It and the other skill, Axebreaker, are no-brainers for the good-to-have tier. Its alternate is the Bow Knight. This is a mounted unit with weaker defenses, but it can use swords and bows. Not the best lineup, if I'm being honest, but you are very accurate thanks to that high skill stat. You can help your ally's accuracy with Rally skill, but the other one is much better, Bowbreaker. If you have a unit that can get this skill that wants to finish as a flyer, this can make their weakness mitigated while making it easier for them to take out the bow user. It goes in the good to have tier. The sniper is the other option to this class, and it's the only one that can use long bows. While that is a good weapon, it better count as those are pretty hard to find, and of course, you're still vulnerable. The skills are hit plus 20, which considering this is a mid-game skill, it doesn't matter too much except on lunatic mode. Enemies max out their stats pretty quickly in this difficulty, so having this skill can easily make up for them being more evasive. But I'd put this in the situational tier regardless. Bowfare is great to have, but mind the fact that snipers can't retaliate against melee units, but this skill can still be active when a sniper is backlighting, so that's something to note. Moving on to the fragile but agile attackers, first we have the Swordmaster. Obviously, they only use the sword, but have an absurd amount of speed. Ostra is their first skill, and when it activates, the user will get 5 attacks in, but they'll do half the damage shown on the bottom screen. So if you were going to do 10 damage, each one is now 5, but if they all hit, it's 25 in that case. Oh, and it doesn't deteriorate your weapon with each hit, so that's really nice. The other skill is Sword Fair which makes the hard-hitting Swordmaster hit even harder. The opposite to that is the Assassin. They have more emphasis on attack and speed, but have even more fragile defenses than their counterparts to make up for it. Of course, they're still really good at opening doors and chests, but hey, if they can finish off an enemy quickly, that's great. Pass allows you to go through enemies to attack others behind them. This is great on paper, but the problem is, this would only work if that enemy you needed to take out was keeping the others alive around them via passive stat buffs, or a boss in a defeat the commander situation, which is pretty uncommon. The only other use I can think of this is to pass an enemy, then switch to a Gale Force user to take advantage of that skill, then kill another unit or get far away instead afterward. Too situational for my liking. The other skill is the one worth noting. Lethality. This is based on your luck divided by 4, so it doesn't trigger that often, but when it does, it's a guaranteed kill that only Miracle can stop. I have not tried a dual guard for it, so that is something you'll have to find out for yourself. 
Now, you may think this is broken, that you should have this despite the rare occurrences, but here's the problem. Both it and counter essentially have a kryptonite. You see, Grima and every enemy in Apotheosis have the Dragon Skin ability, which halves damage, crits, and offensive skills. But it also prevents counter and lethality from activating, so on a normal playthrough these are fine, but for those situations it's not even worth your time. So I'll put it in situational. It is good for street pass teams however. And the last infantry class we'll cover amongst the normal classes is the Trickster. This is a more supportive unit that uses its speed to avoid tricky situations. They get to use staves to support their allies, but if they started out as a thief, they have more options as being able to open doors and chests can come in handy. They make for excellent secondary healing options that can actually fight back. Their first skill is Lucky 7, which grants them hit and avoid plus 20 for 7 turns. Unlike the burn skills, these stats stay consistent and while they're around for half the time, it can contribute much more. It is situational, however, as 7 turns can be manageable, especially if you're speedrunning, but if you're doing that, you're probably not using all your units anyway. But for shorter maps, this is great. Just no long maps and especially Apotheosis, you're not going to want to have to bring this skill. It goes with the situational tier, but it can make the case for great to have. The other skill it offers is the Acrobat class. It allows a unit to cross any terrain, but it does not apply to flyers for obvious reasons. Now, if there weren't any ways to make more flyer units, this might have a use, but considering there's pair up and reclassing, this is a bit redundant. And when you consider Gale Force as well, this is not that good. I'll put it in situational, but that's about as high as it gets here. Now, we shall end this section with the flyers of the game. The first one is the Griffin Rider. It doesn't gain any new weapons, and to be honest with you, this is one of the worst promoted classes in the game. It doesn't have anything to stand out with. However, the skills it offers are excellent. Deliverer offers plus two movement when you're paired up, and this applies to any class you have, so a promoted flyer with this skill can move ten spaces, and you could add more with boots or a rally movement skill. So you can see why I value this as an excellent support skill. The other skill is Lance Breaker. Considering the Lance is one of the more common melee weapons, this is great to have. But the opposite, and way better class, is the Wyvern Lord. You get to use lances and axes, but your stats are what really shine. You're a mobile physical wall. Sometimes even bows might not scare you too much. The first skill is okay. Fast Burn is the opposite, where you start out with Hit and Avoid, plus 15, but over time you lose a point each turn. An okay skill, but it's up to you. Considering if you're aiming to finish maps fast, this is better than Slow Burn in that regard. But the real prize is Sword Breaker. Now you may say that shouldn't be needed, as you have lances in your repertoire already, and that is a good point, but the thing is, Worm Slayers are a thing. And with this skill, it means they're probably not going to hit you. And with a certain special class, this means a lot more for them too. But I'll get to that later. Now, let's move on to the other class you've been waiting for. First, we'll knock out the female exclusive Falcon Knight. This class takes a more aggressive support role, taking on staves to make for a very mobile healer that is more than capable of fighting back. They have rally speed and lance fare to make their fast hitting attacks more powerful. But I'm sure you're more interested in the other class the Pegasus Knight has to offer. Anyone who knows anything about this game, they've heard of this. The Dark Flyer. An even more aggressive flyer that uses magic instead of staves. Sadly, they do not use dark magic like you'd think. This is starting to become a trend. But they make up for that with their signature skill. Their first skill is Rally Movement, an actually solid rally skill at that, but oh no. Oh no, the main skill that everyone has heard of, the most broken skill in the entire history of Fire Emblem, is Gale Force. There's a reason I've not shied away from mentioning it unlike other skills, because most of you have probably heard of it already. But for the new people here, and for the sake of consistency, I will tell you what it does. If the unit with this skill initiates combat and kills its opponent, they get to go again. Now, that might not seem so bad, as you can only KO one person and get this effect per turn. This isn't nerfed like its Fates form, which has so many rules and stipulations to activate. 
You can KO any enemy, regardless of how much HP they have, and go again. But this means if your partner has this skill as well, and they go up front and kill an enemy after you, that means you get to have three turns with this pair. Four if you have a dance on top of it. But even having one person in the pair with this skill is instantly overpowered. You can cheese a lot of maps that have the objective as just beating the boss. And for routing the enemy maps, you can just use your Gale Forcer, who in this case, the Dark Flyer, one round an opponent, then get away from the majority of the enemies and switch to a bulkier partner who can take all the hits. There are many strategies that open up, and in some cases, some units are completely irrelevant if they can't get the skill. So, since only girls can get this, only female Robin, Sumia and her daughter, Cordelia and her daughter, Lissa, Maribel and Olivia are the only parents who can get this naturally. Well, child units too. If you want any of the other child units to get it besides the two I teased that, well, you better hope that this is one of their moms, or in the rare case, dad. Lucina, Kiel, Noir, Na, Brady, Owain, Male Morgan, and Inigo need some situations or certain parents, which I'll get into in the next part to get Gale Force. The boys I mentioned need to inherit it, however, as they cannot learn this skill naturally. The girls I mentioned can get it that way or through a certain parent. Lucina, for example, is an exception, as most of the parents I mentioned above can be her mother, and thus, it's easy to get her Gale Force. Some of the other daughters need the right dad. If you're serious about a lunatic run, or going for apotheosis, having as many units as possible with this skill can make the difference between achieving victory or not even coming close. I am not exaggerating when I say this is the best skill in the history of Fire Emblem, so it's no surprise that this is the meta skill, an absolute must have if your unit can get it. Now that's it for the advanced classes, but we're still not done. We have a few more classes, and these are the special classes. These are classes that only specific characters can get. To make it clear, I will mention who can get these classes, but something to note that in some cases, the Morgans can get these classes if it's not gender exclusive. And there's also the matter of the DLC classes. I described them in my DLC video, link in the description, so I'll simply remind you all of them here. So for now, let's start with the non-DLC classes. First up, we have the Lord class. Only Krom and Lucina have access to it. They use swords only and have the following skills. Dual Strike Plus adds a flat 10% to your dual attack rate, meaning that if Krom or Lucina are in the pair, this means it is very likely they or their partner will follow up. This skill is exclusive to these two, but it's actually worth having. I put it in the Great to Have tier and it works well with Dual Guard Plus, albeit on the other character in the pair up. Charm adds a plus 5 hit and plus 10 avoid rate to all allies within 3 spaces. This is good in the early game, but it will be replaced, so it goes in that tier. The promoted version is the Great Lord, and this is where these two get their bread and butter. They're able to build lances, but also get some of the better skills in the game. Aether is their first skill, and as a note, Krom and Lucina will always pass this on to their daughters no matter what. This skill is activated by your skill stat divided by 2 but it triggers both Soul and Luna in that order. So it makes for an attack that restores HP and then shreds half of the opponent's defense afterward. It's no surprise that this goes in the meta tier. Rightful King is the other skill, and this will always pass on to Krom's sons. This tacks on a flat 10% bonus to the trigger rate of all skills with activation rates. Aether, Soul, you name it. It's not quite meta, but it's still a great skill to have, and especially on these two. Next is Robin's exclusive class, and as a note, if Robin has another child besides Morgan, all of their potential children can reclass into this tree. They use both swords and magic, and have a very balanced but effective stat line. Their first skill is Veteran, which grants 50% more EXP if they're paired up, meaning it's really easy for them to snowball and level up quickly. I put this in the early game tier, but it's a great skill to have while grinding. The other skill is Solidarity, which grants crit and dodge plus 10 to all adjacent allies. I put this in the early game tier as well. The promoted class is the Grandmaster, where Robin's bread and butter can be found. The first skill is their signature attacking skill, Ignis. Now to those who have played Fire Emblem Heroes, it does not work like that one. Ignis in this game works by taking half of your magic or strength stat to the other value that's attacking. 
the trigger rate is your skill stat. So for example, if you're using magic, it will take half of the total stat of your strength and add it to your total attack. Now this skill is ideal to use for classes that use both attacking stats. So the Grandmaster obviously, the Dark Flyer, and the Dark Knight are some examples that can get the most out of Ignis. It's not quite meta, but it is great to have for Robin. The next unique class is the Villager, a weak class exclusive to Donald, but do not let it fool you. It also has a great skill to help him, in particular Snowball. Aptitude boosts all of your growth rates by 20% each. This helps Donald Snowball really quickly and become a very good unit stat-wise. This is in the Great to Have tier, but it should be noted that once you cap out, it's useless. Underdog is the other skill, and this adds plus 15 hit and avoid if the opponent has a higher level, plus 20 if it's an advanced class. This might seem good, but once Donald starts to snowball, this will not matter at all, so I put it in the early game tier. Olivia is the only character with access to the Dancer class. She's not ideal for combat, but she can fight back with a sword. Just don't expect the stats to help her out at first. The first skill is Luck plus 2, and her second is Special Dance. This grants Strength, Magic, Defense, and Resistance plus 2. If you're using her for dancing, then this is great to have for sure. The next class is the Tagwell class, exclusive to Pan and Yarn. This is a class that transforms and gains more stats with the help of a Beast Stone. As such, they are weak to Beast Killers. They are fast hitters, but they're not super bulky. Their skills are Even Rhythm, which grants Hit and Avoid plus 10 on even number turns, which this goes in the no tier for me. And the other is Beastbane, a very interesting skill. You gain super effective damage against any mounted unit. Cavaliers, Pegasus Knights, and Griffin Riders will take bonus damage with this skill on. It's great to have, since there's so many of these units running around. But it should be noted that in maps where they are less frequent, it's just a wasted slot. So it's also borderline situational, but these units are more frequent compared to its counterpart. Speaking of, the counterpart is the Manakeet. These include units like Noe, Gnaw, and Adultiki. They use Dragon Stones and are weak to Worm Slayers. Manakeets are pretty bulky and can always hit from 1 to 2 range, which means they're excellent when you consider that unlike the other games where a Manakeet only had one Dragon Stone usually. You can buy more in this game, so they can always be relevant. They have Odd Rhythm, which is the opposite of Even, and I don't like it either. But they also have Dragon's Bane, which gives them a Worm Slayer effect. This can only work against uh, Wyverns and other Manakeets, which you'll only find in certain DLC maps. This is way more situational than Beast Bane, so I'll put it in the situational tier list. For these next few, you might call them personal skills or equivocal skills. The first term you might know what I mean if you've played Fates or Three Houses before, but the latter is a skill instantly learned through an item. Those will be for the DLC skills, but we'll knock out all the other ones before we get to those. Our first unique skill comes from the Conqueror, Wallheart. He actually has a class by that name all to his own. The only other way for another unit to get it is as if he has Morgan as his son. This is basically a glorified Great Knight, but Wallheart has the skill Conquest, which nullifies all bonus damage from Beast, Rider, and armor effective weapons. I'll put this in the situational category because it's not that much of a need, but it is nice enough to have. Just blame the other good skills you'd rather put on him. The other personal skill comes from Aversa, and that is Shadow Gift. This allows her and her possible daughter to use dark magic regardless of the class. This means you could use tomes like Nosferatu with a Sage or Dark Flyer. That's a big deal actually, as a tome like that is amazing to have and can change your unit's fighting capabilities immensely. As such, this is going in the Great to Have category. Alright, the DLC skills are next, and I must first remind you all these are discussed in my DLC video, so I recommend you look at that one first, especially since the eShop is closing in less than two months. So first, we have All Stats plus two. Unlike the other single stat boosters, this is far better and worth grinding out for in the early game, as those maps are easier and this can stick with you until the mid game. Those extra stats can and will make a difference. It goes in the early game tier. This next skill is meant for grinding only, but it helps fight EXP decay. Paragon simply doubles your total EXP gained, and this means you can grind easier and faster despite gaining less and less the more you level up throughout the course of your playthrough. Iot Shield prevents bonus damage for flyers from bows and wind magic. This doesn't stop all damage, it simply denies the multiplier that would have kicked into effect otherwise. 
I put it into situational because most top tier flyers simply would rather have other skills. Speaking of must have skills, Limit Breaker is a must have for anyone serious enough about a lunatic playthrough or a run at Apotheosis. This raises the cap of all your stats by 10. For example, if your speed capped out at 50, now it's at 60. But HP will not go higher than 80. This is arguably the most important DLC skill in the whole game, as these extra stats will go a long way. At last we have reached the DLC classes, and these are the Bride and Dreadfighter. The Bride is a female exclusive class, and this is a more support-oriented class. It uses lances, bows, and staves. The first skill is Rally Heart, which grants all stats plus 2 within 3 spaces like Spectrum, but unlike Robin's skill, this also adds plus 1 movement. Now, to explain why Rally skills are great to have, a unit who has multiple Rally skills can stack the effects on top of each other. So if you had, say, Female Robin have both Spectrum and Movement, that means when she uses her Rally, she'd be granting all allies within 3 tiles of her, plus 2, and an extra movement space. Do you see where I'm going at with all this? If you have allies who are strictly meant to use rally skills, you can give all 5 slots to them a different skill and use them at the start of the turn to buff as many allies around them as possible, to give them all the bonuses they need to take out enemies efficiently, or in Apotheosis' case, with as little danger as possible, which there's a lot in that map. Rally bots aren't needed on lower difficulties, but for Lunatic, they're almost a must-have for the game's hardest maps. Bond is the second skill that restores 10 HP to all allies within 3 spaces at the start of the turn. Honestly, 10 HP isn't that big of a difference. It can be, but you'd be better off giving those units skills like Renewal or Soul to heal themselves instead. I put this in Situational. Lastly, we have the male exclusive Dreadfighter. This class has access to swords, axes, and magic. It's clearly the more aggressive class having both high speed and attack like a Swordmaster, but has a far more respectable magic stat, and its first skill helps with its longevity. Res plus 10 is immediately more useful than its plus 2 counterpart. Not useful enough to justify and great to have, but enough to not put it in the no or early game tier. Finally, we have Aggressor, the final meta skill of this game, and before you ask why, this skill is basically Deathblow. To give you a Fey equivalent, Deathblow 4 grants plus 8 attack when initiating combat in the player phase. This is basically a made up death flow 5, as this skill grants plus 10 when attacking in the player phase. And considering you can stack this with Gale Force on your Gen 2 boys like Owain and Inigo, this skill becomes extremely helpful in regards to quickly one-rounding foes or shredding bulky targets. It's absolutely a must-have and a no-brainer on the tier list and on your aggressive attacking units. Now, here we are, the end of our skill tier list. Feel free to pause the video to take a good look at it, as I do plan to have a version of it alongside my general class tier list as well. Got a good look? Alright, here's my class tier list. I won't explain everything here, as this is based on the class, its weapons, and its stats, how they stand on their own merits, and yes, their skills are included, but not the deciding factor, as you would expect, because your units will have skills beyond this class's reach. As for what your unit should get, I'm afraid that will need to be saved for another video. Next time, we'll be discussing the parents' skills and classes and what you should get them. I decided to save the child units for a separate video due to them having many possibilities thanks to the fact that they can have so many different dads or moms in some cases. If you have any questions in regards to the skills, feel free to ask them alongside any other thoughts in the comments section below. Thank you so much for watching, and I ask once more that if you are interested in my other Awakening videos, feel free to check them out, and subscribe, as this does help out the channel immensely. Until next time, stay gold.